Can you hear me? Yes. So the last speaker today is Angelo Cicchetto. I hope I got that right. Yeah, that was fine. Uh, activity assistant, self assembly of colloidal particles. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation, Christina, to to Jennifer and to Lisa for organizing this conference, and thank for you. Thank you for actually sticking around for such a long time. All right. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happens when you try to self-assemble a nanoparticle and try to enhance their self-assembly using actually activity. So it's a slightly different take from most of the talk that you've been listening to today. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank the people that actually did most of the work. So most of the work has been done in collaboration. These three guys here are my students and tilted the pictures in the hope that you maybe remember them more likely. Right, and then she is Chantal Valeriani is my external collaborator uh, who's at the University of Madrid, of course, so they had advantage of a uh, very fast computer set and money for money set. Uh, so my group, we've been obsessed about problem self-assembly for over eight years, to the point that I almost hate the word, and I really hope that someone will come up with something different, because I've been re writing that word so many times. And of course, we care about this with the self-assembly, right? Is the, one of the main ways in which biology actually creates structure at a nanoscale, but also, you know, is considered one of the candidates to actually uh, overtake lithographic methods because it's cheap, you don't have to pay for anything, lithography is very, very uh, expensive, and so, you know, if you want to create uh, new materials starting from the bottom up, that would be a very good way to do it, right? And then, of course, I started this slide in 2006, and then over the years, I start adding new nanoparticles that people will be making, and then I kind of lost track. Okay, but um, it is great to actually do computational, uh, computational uh, self-assembly, let's put it that way, right, in the, where the lens scales are actually uh, at the colloidal size, and I have to say this because right now I'm in a chemistry department, so I always have to justify why I'm self-assembling colloids and not molecules, okay? I guess you, I don't have to just like this for you, but the important thing is that, is that now you can have nanoparticles that are not spherical, just spherical anymore. That was like in 1998, for example, but you can have a lot of different phases. You can synthesize particles that are non sphericals just by synthetic methods or by putting together different particles by, by co assembly and then pretty much somehow freezing them, and there you go, a different particle. But you, know, you can control the shape, of, but also, of course, the surface chemistry, right? Uh, I started when I was a postdoc. I was working also with uh, um, Steve Granite, and it was making, you know, basically that was the time of Jones particles, where you can put out, you know, hydrophobic, hydrophobic particles, or you know, dipolar Jones particles. Now, of course, you can make put DNA on these particles, and now uh, you can make um, deformable particles or particles with internal degrees of freedom, getting closer and closer to colloidal polymers if you want. And of course, you can do uh, now, uh, in principle, both things together, right? And then the, the reason why I have this slide because I'm trying, I'm hoping that people who actually synthesize active particles start thinking of making not just rod, not just spheres, but something more interesting than that. And then, okay. And then, of course, once you have so many particles, right, the questions if you're doing theory computational, it's not really more, okay, you got a particle, how is it going to self-assemble? Because you, which particle would you pick, right? And what was much more interesting is that, you know, if I draw something, right, some particular structure that may have some interest in someone, how do you put the building blocks in the fluid so that they will actually spontaneously assemble that into that structure, right? And so the point of this, this is, is a kind of very hard but beautiful problem where you can imagine uh, making simulations where you're not only uh, looking at, uh, um, say it's Monte Carlo molecular dynamics in the space, in the physical space of the particle, but also at the same time in the space of the interaction. So they're trying to get some feedback from some micro simulations to actually alter the interactions on the fly of your of your particle so that eventually maybe you can get to that and then have some success and some bad failures to do that. And this is an unresolved problem, it was one of the twenty problems of the twenty first century from that part. Okay. Anyway, and I was very happy doing this until someone did something like this, right? Put a piece of platinum on the particles, add some hydrogen peroxide, create some oxygen, this stuff starts moving around, right? 
And then, uh, then I saw actually this paper by Di Leonardo. And I guess there was also another one by Sokolov, roughly at the same time. And that kind of changed my life because I realized, oh my god, this guy managed to make a nano gear, nano motor. This is really awesome. What he's really doing is converting the random motion of these active particles into some directed motion. Right, and of course that immediately triggered my fantasy. And what happened if you can you generalize these concepts, right? And so we've been doing some work in these directions, and of course the trick here is that you have a very highly curved surfaces, right? And the particles, as Philly, that is who is in the work in the group of Mike Hagan actually uh, um, explained very well. Um, actually, they developed a formula to describe the dynamics of uh, spherical particles that are, also undergo, that are active and they also undergo Brenner motions uh, on curved interfaces. And what, what you can actually see that you know the, the more curved uh, an interface is, the more likely it's going to be that particle actually will be driven in that direction. And of course, you realize, well, if I take a, like a plate, a passive plate, and I put it in a, in, immerse it in, a, in, a, in an active fluid. And here, by the active fluid, I'm not thinking of very high density active fluids like most of you are actually looking at, but very low density active fluid. Okay? So you can kind of figure out roughly how long will a particle stick around in the very high uh, curvature regions and how long it actually will stick around in the, in the opposite region over there. Right? And by doing very simple calculations, uh, you can estimate roughly the density difference between one side and the other side, and of course every time you have a density different, different that is established there, that object is going to start moving in one direction. Of course it's going to also rotate, but that means in a similar fashion you can make that rotate, but by just controlling the curvature you can make this guy that was initially passive actually become active. And here the scaling laws they can actually work out. And how it depends on the Mostly the important thing on the curvature of the particle and on the, and the propelling force and on the density of the fluid, as long as the density is actually very small. Right? Then we generalize these ideas, not just to rigid objects, but also to flexible objects. What if you actually start putting a somewhat semi flexible rod into an active fluid, and then what you see is that maybe that works. So you start having these really beautiful bistable configurations where you have a rod, if you look, that initially bends to form a pin and then opens up again and then it bends again to form an inner pin, etc. etc. Right? And here, for example, if I look at the radio of duration of this versus the historicity, right, just to have a measure of what happens when this rod is actually not in active fluid but just in the fluid, you see that it's pretty stiff. Actually, as a persistent is three, four times its own length, right? The moment you put it on active fluid, there are relatively small forces, we start having these kind of bistable configurations, right? And then we also try, of course, this only works in two dimensions because in order for this to work, but, you know, the, your, your object has to be able to trap particles in these interiors, okay? And then if you want to do something in three dimensions, of course, you need to take a, an elastic sheet, and this is my version of the iconic. Uh, um, what is it, seen in the American Beauty where you have the, you know, the plastic bag moving around. So this is a membrane, right? You have an active fluid all around, a low density active fluid. That low density means you know, the density is lower so that you don't have any clustering and integration or anything like that. But the forces, so the particles get to the surface and are able actually to apply some forces and depending on the, you know, some asymmetry of many number of particles you have on one side rather than the other side, uh, it's going to start folding. But there is nothing here. This is a rigid membrane. You only have steric interactions and, and, uh, and, and propulsion. So there is, no, there is no reason for this object to actually uh, um, be stable in one particular configuration. And of course, depending on, of course, on the concentration, on the rigidity of your, of your elastic sheet, and then on the profiling force, you can have different phases. Right? The reactive forces are very weak. You just have a planar object. They're not going to bend it. As you increase the strength of the force, they're then going to form some sort of potato chip. But of course, the moment you form a potato chip, you have a curvature here that is different than that. So this is actually going to move like a sail. Right? It's going to move, then it's going to bend in the other direction, it's going to move, etc., etc. If you increase the, 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 the attractive, sorry, the, the, you know, the, the active forces, then you're going to form something basically the equivalent of a Venus flytrap. You have a system that is flat, 
and the certain condition will completely collapses. The way it opens actually is by rolling, and then closes again, and you have almost really by stable integration. If you increase the activity, the system becomes floppy and floppier. In this case, you know, you can't really to, to collapse it. It has to go through a sequence of folding transition. Okay, but this is really not what I want to talk about. I really want to talk about self-assembly of active particles. And of course, if you think about self-assembly of active particles, you are thinking about this. And I caught you using this one at least three times already during this class, and probably also this one. And of course, these are also in my grants. They're very, very popular. I like the color. But I'm going to do something more retro, OK? So instead of looking at self-assembly of that particle and asking, you know, what kind of cool assembly or, you know, new materials or you know dynamic instability or whatever, this particle of flocking behavior, this particle are gonna produce once I really make them uh, highly separate, okay, into a fluid at high density, I'm gonna ask a much simpler question. In, in, in this sense is retro. Suppose that I work very hard to make some some nanoparticles self-assemble passively into a particular structure. Okay? And now I'm gonna ask, uh, can I improve, can I make it faster? Okay, can I increase the dynamics? Can I expand the parameter space where which the self-assemble occurs? And then can I get a better yield? Right? Why, why do I care about this? Because many times people do numerical simulations kind of cheat when they talk about self-assembly. They tell you they can self-assemble pretty much whatever they want if you, as long as you get the right rules. But they don't tell you that's the good. But there is a bad side of this. The bad side is that it is terribly slow. Not only is it terribly slow, but it's very, very hard to actually tune both the strength of the interactions and the geometry of the particles, right? So if you look at here in the white, say that I take this particle, right? Even just in 2D, I've got three patches. And say that on the y-axis, I have something that basically the size of the, um, of the solid angle. That's a measure of specificity of the interaction, right? And I have on the x-axis here, I have the, the strength of the interaction between the particles. So what happens, you try to self-assemble this guy, if the strength is not to, the interaction is not, is not, if the energy of the interaction is not strong enough, nothing happens, right? You get a glass, sorry, you get a gas. If the interaction is just too strong, basically the particles get together, but they can't heal any defects, and you get some really bad gel, typically, right? But now, this is just in terms of the energy. Now, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the geometry of the interaction of the geometry of the particle itself, right? So what happens if, the, in this case, you know, the angular size of the interaction is too large? Yes, you can form your structure, but you can also form a lot of other junk, right? And so you get some amorphous material. But if that interaction is really, really specific, right, almost to a point, then pretty much the particle will never self-assemble because they will never see that point unless you put a very, very large interaction, right? And at that point, yes, sure, they will get together, but they cannot heal defects. So typically, in both this kind of diagram, you've got a very, very narrow region where self-assembly actually happens. And because typically that happens when they K in and K out, right, are roughly similar to each other, the time scale for that actually to finish and to get a decent yield is like incredibly large. Okay? Ask people trying to self-assemble to, to crystallize proteins or uh, the whole community try to actually self-assemble viral capsules. That takes forever. Okay? And so, I guess if I were talking to a chemistry community, I'm thinking of active particles as catalysts, right? And to the physicists, I would say, what happens if I increase the dimensionality of my interaction space? So can I take a shortcut and probably expand this region, and get a better yield, and make it faster? Okay? So, you can start somewhere, you have an infinite number of particles, I pick the triangle, okay? And sure, you can make a triangle, but there's nothing special about a triangle, I could have taken any other possible shape, but what is general about this triangle is that I can, it has some very general features in terms of self-assembly. That means it has a very clear target structure, right? In particular, if I make these two sides attractive and the other one just repulsive, right? It has a very competitive metastable structure, right? The moment I make the interaction between these particles strong enough, these guys are gonna form immediately, 
Okay, and then I entropy because you can make it, can you can arrange it in different in different orientation. And in particular, which is also typical, if you have a low density and the range of the interaction is short, that dynamics is going to take forever and it's going to be very very sluggish. Okay, and these are the three typical situations that you have in most many self-assembly cases, unless you're trying to make an FCC with spheres. Okay, so that. First, you consider the passive case, right? So this is a passive sample signal of this guy. This interaction are not 5 kt, they're 15 kt because, because the interaction range is very short and we also have angular degrees of freedom with respect to the field. Okay? And it is also very typical to what you will get, for, for example, for viral capsid assembly. And look at this, you get 50, the yield is defined as the maximum number of uh, hexagons that you can form with respect to the non total number of, um, sorry, the, Number of hexagons that you can form with respect to the maximum one that you can form given the number of particles that you have in solution. Okay, so we have 600 particles. Each one of them is formed by 30 particles, so you're already on the order of 2,000 particles in there. And you can form 100 hexagons, okay? So that makes it very simple. I don't have, I don't have a lot of time on the Excel machines, so I can make this system super big. Okay, but you can see here, right? And the energy, epsilon is the binding energy when they're really perfectly paired, okay? And so when the energy is very small, you got a gas. When the energy is, very, is sufficiently large, it's not even very large, it's sufficiently large, you're gonna form all this kind of stuff. And you really have a decent yield for, I don't know, one and a half, two kgs, okay? Everything else is zero and then a little bit. Then you have surprisingly 90%. I was very surprised by this. You can get 90% yield of this particle, but it takes forever. Okay? For this particular case, that density from one, it took something like 10 to the 10 to the 5 diffusion times. Okay? And so what happens if I activate these particles? Okay? Of course you have to smart you have to be smart in the way you activate these particles. So we put the activity in this direction, right? So you put it perpendicular to the, to the passive phase and it's going to point directly at that corner, okay? And then all my data are written in terms of this propelling force. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can look at the Peclet number defined as the bare velocity divided by the effective you know, Browning velocity. It just, it's basically proportional to this um, propelling force. I thought sigma is one, kt is one, okay? And so here what happens, I took that point. Right, where I have, I don't know, 4% of yield for the passive case, right? That, that exact point, and now I'm going to activate my particles. If you think of activity just as temperature, what you, what you should expect is that, well, you're moving in that direction. Effectively, you're reducing the strength of the interaction between the particle, therefore, you should get, this is almost nothing, but even less than that, right? You can hand if you actually do this. Ah, you get. The claim number 2.5 or 65% in yield, right away. Increase the peclet number a little bit more, five roughly is gonna stay around there, but then if you make it too fast, it's gonna start declining again, okay? So this is roughly what this behavior looks like. I'm gonna give you like the snapshot for different values of this strength of the interaction and for different values of this peclet number, okay? And then, uh, I don't know if you can see this kind of reddish line over there. That's, that represents the case of the passive, right? So where the t is equal to zero. And you can see that immediately you have, I already showed this particular case, or I actually had also the point for 2.5 didn't put it there. But then you can see I can really expand the range of the uh, interaction energy for which I actually get very good self-assembly. And then, and I get pretty much, or the order of 90%, actually, sometimes even higher, 95%. But I would say that it's roughly within an error bar. So I wouldn't count on that. But if you're sitting there, where you have this very long, elongated junk, you can actually completely fix those and get perfect uh, capsids. Okay? And then this is kind of interesting because you have, here you have a gas. Right, and if you imagine this particle being light-induced, light induced, all of a sudden, 
right? You turn on the light and you have from a self-assembly capsule, you shut off the light, and again, and again you get a gas. And that's, I don't know, probably a little about 50%. Right? Actually, that should be 60%. Okay? But, you know, now you gotta worry. You're in, I'm in chemistry, and you listen to many, many self-assembly uh, talks, and when you talk about self-assembly, there is a very big issue where all chemists make their money, which is catalyst, right? You don't just want to get a big yield, you want to make it fast, okay? And so the question is, sure, I'm, I, I'm expanding the range of parameters for which I get self-assembly, but do I get it faster, right? There are many ways of measuring this. I don't know what, what the self-assembly speed of this stuff would be, but let's say that I only care about self-assembly when I get at least 50% of the yield. I'm just going to completely ignore everything else. Because, because if you're not making anything, that's going to be very fast anyway, right? But that's also very irrelevant. So let's consider the time that it takes right, to make 50% of the yield, and I'm going to take my reference case, the passive case, because I'm going to beat it, right? So I'm going to introduce this kind of thing called self-assembly. It's not the only way to do it, but that's one way. So that is the time that it takes the passive system at its best, right, to self-assemble 50% of the yield, right? And this is the time for any other case. And as you can see, you know, th this is not 90%, it's not as big, but with 70%, you go 35 times faster, okay? And in general, I don't know if you can, you know, this is 5, this is 6.4, 10, 9, 15, 12, 16, 20, 18. It basically, the speed increases basically linearly, almost, right, with, the, with, with, with your particular number. So you do not really compromise the yield. You get pretty much the same yield and maybe a little bit more, but you can do it, in principle, systematically faster. Okay? So what's the, what's the deal with this? Right? Overall, if I had to give a rule for this particular particle, sticky and faster is better, okay? Will this keep going? I don't know, okay? Because to keep going, you have to have a very, very large box, okay? Otherwise, your particle is going to fly through the box with boundary condition that you're going to have problems, right? But I think it, it already, if you can do it 35 times faster, that's a very big improvement, right? And then the other thing is that typically this happens not surprisingly, when the, basically the, the strength of the active forces are comparable to the strength of the, uh, uh, of the interactions between the particles. Right, so what's the deal here? The deal is this. Because of the way I endow my particle, the activity in my particle, every time I form something like this, I can increase the activity to any amount, right? And this is going to stay stable because basically, if you just look at the components of the vector, what the activity is really is increasing the strength of the bond, right? And I'm going to call these active bonds. You take two, you take two cubes. They're going to go next to each other. They're going to push against each other. They're actually for a cube, actually for any two flat spaces, there are stabilizing forces. They're going to stay there pretty much forever, even if they didn't have any attraction. On the other hand, every time you get something that looks like this. So basically, over the sum, the vectorial sum of the potrelic axis is not equal to zero. This is going to be immediately destroyed, right? Therefore, cell propulsion is acting as a geometry filter. It only allows to be stable something that you kind of coded into the way you introduce the propulsion mechanism into the nanoparticles, right? But that's not the end of the story because it doesn't just act at that level, right? If you take two nanoparticles that are approaching in this direction, again, whether you have an attraction between them or not, they're going to feel an attraction due to the F, due to the active forces, right? You're going to be pushed against each other, and they're going to move together. And this is a structure that is compatible with your final structure. On the other hand, if they arrange this way, right, the shear force is just going to break you apart, right? So you have this selection that is acting already on the early stages of the dynamics. That's why it's actually very, very fast. <laughs> All right. I'm very happy about this. I understand this. If the force is not large enough to break the bonds between the particles and the interaction strength is very large, all you're going to do to those large clusters, they're going to rotate, right? 
they're not going to break them. So this, the strength of the force, you can probably get this boundary by simple geometric arguments. It has to be large enough. Okay? What I don't understand is this. Why? When I increase the strength of the interaction, since I'm, I'm not doing anything to that, right? Why do I have a yield that actually decreases? Okay? It's not what I should be able to break. The stronger the interaction between the particles, the more easily I break what I don't like, and the more I stabilize this guy. So that should have a very high yield there, but it's not happening. Okay? So the reason why this is happening is that this bastard single particles that you form every time you break your clusters now have enough carry enough energy to actually push your hexagon away along that particular edge, right? Because now that is very weak. All it takes, you take one out by pushing it, and you basically, you kill basically the, the, the vectorial sum that was keeping it together, basically, okay? And so, um, of course, you can also have small fluctuations within the particle, but, you know, um, let me put it this way. The vectorial sum is best to be zero, Right? If it's not exactly zero, because that is a very hard condition to actually find with my fluctuation, that is still going to be stable unless the forces are really, really, really large. And typically, this is the main mechanism by which actually you actually break the particles. Okay? And it's also the same, the very reason why I cannot get, unfortunately, stable hexagonal uh, structures without any interaction. Right? Because I'm pretty sure I could make that without any interaction. I need the interaction. I do form the structures continuously in an active system without any attraction, but a lot of this is just that particular plane there is extremely weak. I just have to push it and just going against thermal flotations. Okay? You can improve it a little bit if you, if you form ep, um, uh, heptagons, okay? because there is not a clear, but still you're going to break that, those. Okay? So, come on, how long? No, 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 I'm cold. So, now, I'm going to get greedy, right? How am I going to fix this, right? I really want to get it better, right? I want to fix this, right? And so the idea is this. I, I need to, there is absolutely no reason to use a constant propelling force. So here the idea is this. If the attraction between the particle is strong enough, right, I can, in a chain, in a, in a, and I have a pulsating force, right? When there is no force, the attraction, I'm going to keep the stuck my hexagon together. When I put the force in there, the particles are going to actually be overstabilized. So that does not affect my hexagons. But if I break up the motion of the particles, right, probably I'm going to decrease the probability of these flying objects that are going to actually collide with my particle, with, with my uh, small structure. Okay? I'm breaking up the path. So they're, gonna, they're not going to push for that much. So hopefully, if, if I make it passive for long enough time, they may just deviate, rotate, and go somewhere else. Okay? And at least that's the idea. And so I'm going to use this kind of pulsating field. Tau zero is just this time. I'm going to keep it on for tau on, off for tau off. And then it was kind of, you take that point, and then you can really improve your yield incredibly. Okay? You go from basically nothing to 95% of the yield. Okay, so that really, really works. Since I have to wrap it up, it turns out to understand what that, what's happening there, you, it turns out you can solve this exactly. If you have a single particle, and you put the velocity, right, so these are the Brownian equation. This is your velocity that now depends on this, you know, step function, basically. You solve it, you got basically double integrals of exponents, and you have a series of these exponents, but you can sum them up because it's basically just a geometric series. That's a result, for example, for the diffusion, right? But you have the two nasty function, but the cool thing is that if you look at very fast switching, then that becomes exactly like the, um, the diffusion of uh, a particle with a constant speed. Just the speed is not the one that you put in there, but it's an effective speed, okay? That is modulated by how long do you stay on with respect to the total period, all right? And then throwing this out there, maybe you can use this to externally modulate the speed of your particles. In particular, if you have light particles, right? How are you going to 
change the speed of the particle. You, you will have to change the concentration of, 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 I guess, of your fuel or do something else. Here, you just, you, this is me with a joystick, changing, pulsing the speed of the particle, on, off, on, off, on, off, right? And in principle, you can control. There are issues, you know, how quickly you can do that, with respect to how quickly the particle can pick up speed, etc. Right? But this is in principle, so I gotta wrap it up. I was there, right? If this idea of effective, of effective um, propulsion is actually true, what should happen is that these points here should be mapped, right, along this line, because what I'm doing when I'm switching relatively fast is just effectively changing the force. There you go. That's what you would expect for a, for a simulation of constant force, and this is what you would expect for a simulation of roughly a constant force. Right, which is going to be, for example, 4.16. 4 we actually did the simulation. The good thing, and then I'm going to wrap it up. The good thing is that this is not quite the same, because in this case, I'm going a little bit off the approximation where I can just take the exponential and do a Taylor expansion. Right? This is definitely twice the diffusion time of the particle that I'm actually keeping it off. And so what you gain by doing that is actually you have self-assembly that's six times faster. Right? So, overall, last slide. So, if you look at these lines, some lines where the ratio between tau on and tau off is constant, right? It seems that the faster you do your clicking, the better self assembly actually you get. And the slower you do it, actually, it's not going to improve, but actually, it's going to make it worse. Okay? And typically, I think as a rule of thumb, you want to have. You want to keep it off for roughly an amount of time that is comparable to the rotational diffusion time of the particles. Okay? That's what seems to be happening. The message. It can greatly benefit. Self-assembly can greatly benefit from some propulsion. As long as you put the propulsion in an appropriate way. That's why I'm really asking, please make particles that are non-spherical. Okay? Then for this particular system, and I think for every system that actually self-assemble into some sort of compact structure, this is pretty much the rule that has to be uh, satisfied for self-assembly to really keep this constant and rip apart every single that it's going to fall. Okay? And of course, the propellant has a key point inside. Right? And so typically, you're going to get better self-assembly roughly when the strength of the active forces is comparable to the strength of the dispersion forces. And then fast switching, so basically giving bursts of activity, is actually better than keeping activity constant for this particular problem. That's not that simple. Anyway, apologies for switching. Thank you. Are there questions? Yeah. Can we get a microphone? Anyone else? Please lift your arm and hand. Um, so, can this be mapped to a stochastic ratchet when you're flashing it on and off because essentially you're letting it rotation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, like, oh my god, this should be a running tumble, uh, actually like a running tumble bacteria because it's going straight, right? And then it basically stops for a little bit. You can imagine, you know, when you shut, when you stop the light, it's, there's no movement that much, but if you wait long enough, it's going to pick up a running rotation, right? The, the difference is that here, your, the amount that it rotates is really depending on how much you keep it off. But actually, that is important, and of course, you are. I guess it, I'm thinking in a bacteria or in a ratchet is kind of stochastic, right? In this case, it is kind of systematic, but you can definitely generalize it to that because the, the I guess the periodic on-off may not actually be the, the best way of going out. Well, it's, it's, it would actually be a stochastic ratchet and not a Brownian ratchet. They're not quite the same. But, but I think okay. Yes, please. It's very interesting work. Um, I, I, I wonder, it's not always obvious to know what is the appropriate way to, to propel the particles. So in the middle of your talk, you show this example of getting a honeycomb lattice from these three patch particles. Yes. If I want to make that process faster, which way should I propel the particles? All this only works if you're forming something that is actually compact, right? If this, just because, so again, 
the sound that the vectorial axis of the particles along the propulsion has to be equal to zero. Otherwise, they're going to destroy everything, or you're going to destabilize what you form, right? That particular case is not going to form something that is actually finite. It's going to grow into a crystal. And for that case, I don't, probably you can speed up a little bit the dynamics, right? But it's not actually obvious what is going to happen. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I don't see any, so let's thank all speakers of the afternoon session. You just give me a minute, uh, I just like to make an announcement. Uh, I want to remind you that tonight we have a very special event. Um, we have uh, a string concert upstairs in the atrium at 8 p.m. This is a uh, uh, show you something here. Uh, here we go. Oh well. Ah, I, of course, is at the top. Thank you. <laughs> oh, maybe this thing doesn't show. Anyway, uh, so let me just tell you. So this is actually a, a concept by a string quartet called the called Jack Quartet is a, a very young uh, group based in New York City that actually plays contemporary uh, classical music. And uh, they will play, play various pieces, but in particular they will play a, the world premiere of a new piece that was uh, uh, commissioned by the Syracuse Soft Matter Program and uh, inspired by the theme Order from Disorder. Uh, the composer is Andrew Wagonier, which is actually a professional composer. He's also a professor of composition here at Syracuse University. And the concert will be followed by sort of a question and answer and discussion with both Andrew Wagonier and Mark Bowick, the director of the Sound Matter program here at Syracuse, on uh, the role of science in the natural world and soft matter in particular on inspiring uh, arts and the music in, in particular. Uh, Mark and Andrew actually uh, will lead the discussion. They actually worked together in the past uh, in uh, co-teaching some uh, classes on uh, science and music a few years ago, and that's where the idea came from. So 8 p.m. upstairs in the atrium, there will be a reception afterwards, and I do hope to see you all there. And this is a string concert, so please don't walk in or out during the concert, just try to come on time. Thank you. Thank you.